Russian President Vladimir Putin's political opposition has taken to the streets once again in cities across the country. They were ignited by the imprisonment of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who was said to be near death in the prison infirmary, partly the result of a 24-day hunger strike, which he ended Friday. Last month, President Biden announced new sanctions against Russia for incarcerating Navalny, who has become an international symbol of freedom in an increasingly autocratic country. Navalny was taken into custody as he returned to Russia in January after treatment in Germany for a near-fatal poisoning. We spoke last fall in Berlin as he recovered. And as we reported then, he told us he was aboard a flight from Siberia to Moscow when he began to feel very sick. I said to the flight attendant, and I kind of shocked him with my statement, uh, well, I was poisoned, and I'm going to die. And I immediately lay down uh, under his feet. Alexei Navalny was on a flight to Moscow from Siberia, where he'd been campaigning against Putin's party in a local election when he collapsed with no pain, but knowing he was dying. Actually, every cell of your body just uh, telling you, that's body, we are it's done. Over. One of the other passengers turned on his phone and captured Navalny moaning in anguish. The pilot made an emergency landing in Omsk, where medics, thinking Navalny must be a drug addict, administered the usual treatment for an overdose and rushed him to a local hospital, where they said he wasn't poisoned, but wouldn't let him leave for days. Well, it was a big fight, and they thought that after 48 hours, these, uh, these poison would be untraceable. And uh, they just keep me there until this 48 hours will be gone. Navalny is under constant surveillance. His wife, Yulia, says government agents were at the hospital controlling access to her husband and, she believes, calling the shots. At the time, Navalny was in a coma, unaware that his wife, Yulia, was waging a public campaign to encourage Western diplomatic pressure and... Did you write a letter to Putin? Yeah, I did it. Dear Mr. Putin, free my husband. I wrote, like, I insist that he should do it. <laughs> I demand you free my husband. Yeah. It was an uh, online campaign, let him out, and Putin thought it would be safe for him uh, just let me out after the, uh, 48 hours. So, after 48 hours, the Russian government allowed him to be flown by air ambulance to a hospital in Berlin known for its experience with victims of poison attacks. And I gather they suspected poison right away? Uh, yes, of course. Meanwhile, his team in Siberia searched his hotel room, collecting things Navalny may have touched, like this water bottle which the doctors in Berlin sent along with a blood sample to a German military lab to see exactly what the poison was. And the answer was Novichok. They discovered Novichok, this nerve agent, uh, in my blood, in, inside of body, on my body, and all this bottle from the hotel. So uh, that's why we now we know that I was poisoned in the hotel, because I, uh, well, it's, uh, again, it's just a pure speculation because no one knows what, what, what happened exactly. But I think that when I was uh, maybe put some clothes with this, um, with this poison on me, I touch it with the hand and then I sip from the bottle. So this nerve agent was not inside of a bottle, but on the bottle. Novichok is a highly toxic nerve agent said to be 10 times more potent than sarin gas. Labs in France and Sweden corroborated the finding. There's no doubt it was military-grade Novichok. It's maybe it's the most toxic uh, agent invented by the uh, humans. So it's a new type of Novichok, which prove that, unfortunately, Putin have a developing new program of this chemical weapon, which is forbidden. The Russians have said that they destroyed all these chemical weapons. Uh, that's why, actually, they deny everything, because it means that they still have this Novichok. So it means uh, they're not just violating with the keeping it. They uh, uh, continue to improve it. And so, there's uh, no doubt that Russia is the only place that where that could have come from. This is absolutely correct. 
It's a banned substance. It's a banned yes. substance. I think for Putin, uh, why he's using this chemical weapon to do, do both, kill me and, you know, terrify others. It's something really scary with the people just drop dead without, there are no gun, there are no shots, and in a couple of hours you will be dead and without any traces on your body. It's something terrifying and Putin is enjoying it. You have said you think that Mr. Putin's responsible. I don't think, I'm sure that he's responsible. Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, says the charge is completely baseless and unacceptable. But Angela Merkel of Germany and Emmanuel Macron of France have persuaded the European Union to impose sanctions over this. Well, all these leaders have signed on except Donald Trump. Yes, I, I have noticed it. <laughs> is it important to you that he condemn this action? So um, I think it's extremely important uh, that everyone, of course, including and maybe in the first row president of the United States, to be very against using chemical weapon in the 21st century. But why would Putin want to poison Alexei Navalny? When we first met Navalny three years ago, he was running against Putin for president. He had made a name for himself by getting his hands on incriminating internal financial documents related to high-level officials and posting them on a blog. Did these documents that you got prove corruption? Uh, absolutely. I work as a whistleblower, and I'm not afraid to uh, announce the names. He says he found that the Kremlin's inner circle was accumulating vast amounts of wealth and published pictures of multiple homes and yachts. He moved on to airing documentaries on YouTube with video of the officials' lavish lifestyle. And uh, it's, uh, it's something very special about Mr. Putin, that he's crazy about money, personal money, about his family being rich, his friends, like all his uh, people who was served he, with him with the, uh, in the KGB, all of them, they are billionaires. That's why fighting corruption means for him that he's fighting me. You know, I'm smiling because here you are. You have survived the most potent nerve agent there is, and you are as fiery and worked up about, your, about Putin and what's going on in this country as you were when I met you a couple of years ago. Well, I'm... Glad. <laughs> I'm glad that I survived and... Uh... His blog inflamed so much outrage in 2017 that tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets against Putin. When Navalny called for a second round of protests three months later, he was arrested before he even left his apartment building. He's been jailed so many times he's lost count. He's been beaten, had green dye with acid splashed in his face, and now he can add poisoning to his resume and blame sure President Putin. Well, how can you say that? Why wouldn't it be one of the oligarchs whom you've embarrassed by, as you say, exposing their corruption? Even for an oligarch, it's impossible to get this Novichok. It's not something you can buy in the store, even if you have a millions of the billions of dollars. Maybe more important, you cannot use it. You will kill yourself and everyone around. Uh, because it's very difficult to, you know, apply Contain it. it. Yes. yes. Yeah. And uh, then this huge cover-up operation, there is no criminal investigation so far. If, if Putin is not responsible, why there is no investigation? And uh, look what they're doing right now. Like uh, Putin with a conversation with the French President Macron, mm -hmm. he said, well, Navalny poisoned himself. Seriously. Mr. Putin told the president of France that you poisoned yourself? Yes, it was just to, you know, annoy him. <laughs> Putin is contending with rounds of protests in the far eastern part of the country, with people taking to the streets for the past three months. Navalny thinks the attempt on his life is connected. Despite his controlling police, judges, courts, media and everything, Still, he's uh, like, uh, he understands that he's surrounded by protests and it's increasing. So that's why his, uh, they decided to, you know, ex for extreme measures. This is what he looked like just a month ago, soon after his doctors brought him out of an induced coma. Rail thin, with a sickly pallor, 
This photo was taken the first day he saw his children after being taken off a ventilator. So you were in a coma, and then you woke up. And what happened? After this coma, I just jumped to the long period of kind of crazy hallucinations and several, you know, steps of uh, realizing where I am, who I am, and uh, I could not speak and I could not write. How has this affected your family? <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a difficult situation, but they stand it and uh, Including did great. your children? Including your, children. Your son is 12 and your daughter is in college. Right. Those are tough ages to realize that your father well, came close they, to being assassinated. Did they say to you, Pop, Dad, you have to stop? Absolutely not. No, um, absolutely not. My, I, I'm very lucky man because I have all support from my family. You'd almost have to at this point. Yeah. Navalny, his wife, his bodyguard, and I went out for a walk in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, and a phalanx of police showed up. So you, you certainly travel with a lot of protection. Yes, I have a lot of security. But He's under the protection of the German government because there's concern he could be the target of another poisoning. And yet, he said he's determined to return to Moscow in a couple of months, as soon as he's 100 percent, and resume his work where he left off, campaigning against Vladimir Putin. You know, you used to be known as the man who had no fear. But what about your family? Do you ever think uh, that you are putting them in danger? That is the toughest part. Yes, I don't feel any fear, but children, what is kind of really horrible thought if they will try to use this Novichok somewhere around my apartment mm -hmm. where my mm -hmm. children is coming, like, wow. you know, this door or something, but everyone can touch it. But anyway, we should fight these people because they will never stop. They will poison someone else. They will poison more people. Well, how do you feel now? Are you back? totally back? You seem to be. I still need some time to recover, and I'm working on it. But you do go to rehab. Do you go every day? Yes. To learn from the scratch how to, how to move, how to do some things. They're interesting that um, I feel kind of a bit a wooden or a tin man, like from the Wizard of Oz, because the body lost all flexibility at all. Interesting how it's work. I have no idea. It's, now it's uh, uh, difficult movies for me, for, for example, pick something from the ground. What about the psychological effect of having, knowing that somebody tried to kill you, came uh, that close? You know, uh, I think it's a, it's a good thing. It's very useful for politician maybe facing that once because it's changed you a bit. So maybe, ironically, I became kind of more human after these facing deaths. The Biden administration's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, on CNN last Sunday, warned the Kremlin of consequences if Alexei Navalny dies in custody. A lot's been said about Russia meddling in our 2016 presidential campaign, but the Russians are already buzzing about their presidential election next March because unexpectedly, Vladimir Putin has a genuine challenger, a handsome 41-year-old lawyer, Alexei Navalny, who has chosen one of the most dangerous occupations in the world, running against the man who controls the Kremlin. The election process in Russia is tightly managed by the government, but Navalny has been drawing big crowds to his protests and rallies all over the country, where he laces into Putin with no holes barred. Putin is a thief and the head of the entire corrupt system. This is one brave man, not only because he has taken on the all-powerful Vladimir Putin head-on, but because he's been holding rallies, many of them without official permits, which has had its consequences, one arrest after another. Where's the 
During my campaign, I spent every fifth day in the jail. So now I'm kind of, you know, used to it. Nothing new for me. It's, it's became a routine of my life. You got out of prison just a couple of days ago. Right. You held a rally right away. And you're, you're goading them. You're begging them to arrest you again. These are people who are trying to steal my country. And I strongly disagree with it. I'm not going to be, uh, you know, a kind of speechless person right now. I'm not going to keep silent. You're not allowed to run. I'm not allowed to run. And they put enormous pressure of our, on our headquarters and on our uh, volunteers. My uh, chief of campaign get out of jail just yesterday. So uh, all these uh, facts show us that he's really afraid, not of me, but these uh, people who are standing behind me. We have uh, now 170,000 uh, volunteers. Mr. Putin remains highly popular. It's all but a foregone conclusion that he'll be reelected. And yet the Kremlin is doing everything it can to make it difficult for Navalny to gain traction. For instance, the government says he can't be on the ballot because he was found guilty of embezzlement and what Navalny insists was a trumped up charge and he's barred from national television. But he's managed to get around that by reaching an ever-widening audience on social media channels and YouTube, where he has millions of followers and says he's raised almost $4 million from ordinary Russians. What do you think the biggest issue is for most people here in Russia? Poverty and inequality huge in Russia, even compared to the United States, the European country. No opportunities at all, no future for the people. Putin is stealing their future. And Mr. Putin puts his relatives, his closest friends, his colleagues from the KGB at the chiefs of this company. And that's why they're controlling the whole economy. Navalny began his public life 10 years ago in a shrewd way. He bought small shares of state-owned companies. As a shareholder, he was able to get his hands on internal financial documents, investigated evidence of misconduct, and posted it all on a blog. Did these documents that you got prove corruption? Oh, absolutely. I work as a whistleblower, and I'm not afraid to uh, announce the names. He says he found that the Kremlin's inner circle was accumulating vast amounts of wealth and published pictures of multiple homes and yachts. He moved on to airing documentaries on YouTube with video of the officials' lavish lifestyle. How did you get the oh, footage? Now uh, we have our Air Force. Uh, we, we're just What's using it? drones. Uh, you uh, sent drones out? Yes, we do a lot of work with the drones because for, for us it's a best way to show this way of life. When you uh, publish this footage of the yachts, of these palaces, of these real estates, and uh, you, uh, you can show documents, look, this guy have a relatively modest salary, but look at this house. His most watched documentary, with over 25 million views, focused on Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev and his estates, Navalny says all five of them. The video inflamed so much outrage that in March, tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets. When Navalny called for a second round of protests three months later, he was arrested before he even left his apartment building. But his supporters came out in droves all across the country. And like Navalny, close to 1,700 were arrested. These were the first protests of this magnitude in Russia in six years. Back then, in 2011, roughly 60,000 went to the streets in a burst of anti-Putin dissent. That's when Navalny debuted in Moscow as an opposition leader. As we were watching in the United States, I think there was the impression that public opinion was going to force change here. It looked that way on television. But that is not what happened. Mr. Putin realized that his, uh, it's not affordable for his system 
to give people more democracy. That's why in the uh, 2012, he completely changed his strategy and uh, start to arrest people, start, start to fabricate criminal cases. Look, and at the uh, start of the 2011, I was a respectful lawyer. At the end of the 2012, I was several times convict. But now he's seen as the last man standing, since most of the other opposition leaders either fled the country or were found dead under mysterious circumstances. Why are you still alive? Uh, this is a favorite qu question of my wife. I don't know. Maybe they missed uh, the uh, good timing for it when I was less famous. Do you feel that your visibility, with so many people knowing who you are, um, that that's protecting you? Well, actually, I'm trying not to uh, thinking about it uh, a lot, because if you start to think uh, what kind of risks I have, uh, you cannot do anything. Navalny's platform includes more spending on education and health, restoring a free press, and taxing the oligarchs. In the West, he's assumed to be a Russian liberal, but there was a time when he marched with nationalists, some of them fascists, something he's tried to downplay lately. You have attended nationalist, what we would call right-wing rallies, uh, I believe in support of ethnic purity, Russian ethnic purity. Have you supported that? Uh, of course not. I uh, was part of these uh, rallies because I support the freedom of rallies, because I uh, support uh, freedom for meetings. Oh, they're supporters of yours. Uh, they're part a lot of, of your following. A lot of them support me and they recognize me as a leader. When he was growing up, he came from a committed communist family in a small town south of Moscow. What was your childhood like? I'm 41 years old. It means that actually I'm a guy from the Soviet Union. Huh? I was a young pioneer. I had my red tie. My father was the military. And I was very proud that my father is guarding Mother Russia from evil Americans with their bombs and missiles. Actually, my biggest memory that I'm as a child standing in line standing in line maybe sometimes for hours to just buy milk. He was close to his brother Oleg, seven years younger. So it was painful for him when three years ago, the government, to get him to stop his activism, he believes, convicted him and Oleg of embezzlement, a ruling the European Court of Human Rights called arbitrary and unfair. To make matters worse, he got a suspended sentence but Oleg is still behind bars. He's still in prison and he spent uh, two years in the solitary confinement, which is uh, actually in Russian condition is torturing. And you think he's in jail to get you, to get you to stop? Yes, absolutely. But he hasn't stopped, even though he's been physically attacked. While campaigning in Siberia, he was splashed in the face with green dye. It was painful, but I could... Uh, it hurt. It, it hurt. But he handled it with humor, saying he was Shrek. <laughs> His followers dyed their own faces green and posted photos to Instagram and Twitter in solidarity. Then he was splashed again. <laughs> Second time was much more painful. There was acid as I understand it. My uh, doctor in the hospital said, well, Alexei, you should be prepared that you will be blind for one eye. And so I even start to think about kind of, you know, I will be such kind of pirate with the... With a patch. With a patch. The Kremlin did allow him to travel to Spain for specialized surgery. But immediately after the treatment, he returned to Moscow and went right out campaigning again. But lately, he's been concentrating on rural areas, holding rallies far from the big cities in places like Siberia and the Urals. I'm traveling every weekend to spend Friday, Saturday and Sunday in the regions to have these rallies. On our last day there, we went with him to the mid-sized industrial city of Ivanova, four hours outside Moscow, starting with a train ride. Mr. Putin never, ever mentioned your name 
may criticize you, but never your name. What do you make of that? I have no idea why they're doing it. Maybe it's a kind of something uh, superstitious for them. Like, you know, you, you, you cannot name the animal because if you name it in the night, it will come and eat you or something like this. And they ha have a lot of nicknames and euphemism for me, like uh, this gentleman, uh, this guy, this convict, and this, uh, this convict. Uh, this convict. Uh, but uh, they are thinking about me, and believe me, they are afraid of me, afraid of us. So it's, uh, that is much more important for us than mentioning my name. It was snowing and dark out when we got to a wooded lot on the edge of town where a big crowd of mostly young Russians was waiting. No one thinks he has much of a chance of beating Putin in the election. But still, Putin fears him, Navalny says, because of his ability to draw crowds at rallies and into the streets. He perseveres, knowing what he's doing is dangerous. His supporters have been roughed up by police and pro-Kremlin activists who Navalny calls thugs. Is it, in your mind, worth your life? because there is a big target on you, no question. Uh, I'm trying to not to think about it, because look, I think I'm ready to sacrifice everything uh, for my job and for the people who are surrounding me. I'm not let them down. And I'm trying to not to reflect about it all the time. Questions continue to surround the role Russia may have played in President Trump's election last fall and about the president's professed admiration for Vladimir Putin's skills as a strong leader. What the president doesn't talk about is the unfortunate fate that stalks some of Putin's most prominent critics. They have been victims of unsolved shootings, suspicious suicides, and poisonings. Tonight, the story of one of them. Vladimir Karamurza was an opposition activist on the front lines, protesting Putin's policies, organizing demonstrations, and town hall meetings. He knew he was on a dangerous mission. When we met him last year, he told us that one day in May 2015, he learned just how dangerous. I was in a work meeting uh, with my colleagues in Moscow uh, when I suddenly started to feel uh, really sick, and I went within about 20 minutes from feeling completely normal to feeling like a very sick man. And I don't remember anything for the next month. You were out for a month? I was in a coma for a week, and I don't remember anything for a month, and had basically a cascade of all my major life organs failing one after another, just switching off, uh, you know, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys. He was shuttled from hospital to hospital in Moscow for two days as doctors frantically tried to figure out what was wrong with him. I was at one point connected, I think, to eight uh, different artificial life support machines, and doctors told my wife that it's only going to be about 5% chance uh, that I'll survive. But he beat the odds. When we spoke with him last year, he'd been recovering for a year, but he was still walking with a limp from nerve damage. So what happened? Well, it was some kind of a very strong toxin. We don't know what it was, because you know, with these things, as, as people who know more about this than I do explain to me, you basically have to know exactly what you're testing for in order to find it. So they never found the exact compound? They never did. It wasn't until the fourth day, and after he'd been on a dialysis machine, that blood was drawn and sent to a toxicology lab in France. It found heavy metals in his blood, but no specific toxin. Still, Karamurza maintains that he was poisoned. I have absolutely no doubt that this was uh, uh, deliberate poisoning that it was intended to kill, because uh, as I mentioned already, my, the doctors told my wife that it's about a 5% chance of survival, and when it's that kind of percentage, it's not to scare, it's to kill. Can you be sure that what happened to you was directed by Mr. Putin? Well, of that I have no idea. I don't know the precise circumstances, I don't know the who or the how, um, but I do know why. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. In recent years, quite a few of Putin's enemies have perished by swallowing things they shouldn't have. In 2006, Russian spy turned Kremlin critic Alexander Litvinenko drank tea laced with polonium-210. 
Two years earlier, the Ukrainian politician Viktor Yushchenko had somehow ingested dioxin. He survived, but was disfigured. But what would the motive be in the case of the critic Vladimir Karamurza? Cambridge educated, he was for years a Washington-based reporter for a Russian TV station. So he was well-connected and had perfect English, which he used to incessantly criticize the regime on the international stage. A government that is based on genuine support does not need to jail its opponents. As if his outspokenness wasn't enough to anger the Kremlin, he made matters worse for himself when he joined forces with this man. It's death if you cross the Putin regime. Bill Browder was for years the largest foreign investor in Russia and Putin's champion, but he turned into a dogged adversary when his Russian tax attorney, Sergei Magnitsky, blew the whistle on alleged large-scale theft by government officials. We discovered massive corruption of the Putin regime. Sergei exposed it, testified against the officials involved. He was subsequently arrested, put in pretrial detention, tortured for 358 days, and killed at the age of 37. Browder was so outraged, he joined with Vladimir Karamurza to lobby the U.S. Congress for a law targeting those responsible for that death and other human rights violations. They succeeded. The Magnitsky Act passed in 2012. It's the first law that sanctions individual Russians, 44 so far. The Magnitsky Act is designed to sanction, to freeze the assets and, and ban the visas um, for people who commit these types of crimes in Russia. So they can't get to their money, which may be stashed in the United States. And so Vladimir Putin is extremely angry that the Magnitsky Act was going to be passed. He was even angrier when it got passed. And he was even angrier when people started getting added, names started getting added, added to the Magnitsky list. One reason Vladimir Karamurza is convinced he was targeted is because six people connected to the Magnitsky case, as he was, have ended up dead. One of them was Boris Nemtsov, a leader of Russia's opposition and Karamurza's partner in lobbying for the Magnitsky Act. On the 27th of February uh, 2015, uh, he was killed by five bullets in the back as he was walking home, as he always did out in the open without bodyguards. This was an assassination. In some of the deaths, proving there was foul play has been a challenge. Take the case of this Russian banker who came forward with incriminating documents related to the Magnitsky case. Alexander Parapolichny was a whistleblower. At the age of 44, he went jogging outside his home in Surrey, outside of London, and dropped dead. The police deemed it a unsuspicious natural death. Well, they did look for poison, they just couldn't find any. They did a very first round toxicology screen. They, they, they didn't find anything on the first run through. Detecting poison can be extremely difficult, and there's a reason. This Cold War CIA memo reveals that the Soviets ran a laboratory for poisons in a large and super-secret installation known as the Chamber to test undetectable compounds. In the case of the banker in London, the coroner wasn't willing to give up. He ordered more tests. And three years later, it was revealed in court that an exotic toxin was found with the help of an authority on flowers. A small sample of his stomach contents was sent to a um, botanical garden outside of London. And one of the scientists found a compound called Gelsemian elegans, which is a Chinese herb. They call it the heartbreak grass. And it causes a person to die unexpectedly without explanation. Still, there's no direct evidence of a Kremlin connection. But the list of those who've come to die unexpectedly after running afoul of Mr. Putin is long. Political opponents and human rights lawyers have been shot. Overly inquisitive reporters have perished in mysterious plane crashes, or by car bombs, by poison, or gunfire. Journalist Anna Polakovskaya was poisoned and shot. Then there are enemies who kill themselves, one by hanging, one by stabbing himself to death with two knives, and one by tying himself to a chair and jumping into a swimming pool. Some of Putin's opponents are in prison, others forced out of the country, like Mikhail Kordakovsky, probably Putin's most famous living critic. 
Are you afraid for your own life? For a period of over 10 years, Vladimir Putin had ample opportunity to make a decision about putting an end to my life in a very easy way, just by snapping his fingers. And today, it's a little bit more difficult. Khodorkovsky was once the richest man in Russia until he took to opposing Putin. He was put on trial, his oil company confiscated, and then thrown in prison for 10 years. Home is now London, where he funds a Russian pro-democracy movement. And this is where the plot thickens, because one of his senior organizers on the ground in Russia is none other than Vladimir Karamurza. There are people who say that what's happened to Karamurza is a message to you, a message to you to back off. You know, for 10 years, I was receiving lots of messages from our authorities of various sorts. And some of these messages were rather unpleasant concerning my physical well-being. But the authorities saw I ignored these messages. I would like to believe that they have not forgotten that. In 2015, once Vladimir Karamurza was stabilized, he was flown to Washington, D.C. to continue treatment near his wife, Yevgenia, and their three children who live in the U.S. for their safety. But as soon as Karamurza got better, he was itching to go back to Russia. I think what my husband believes in will always outweigh the fear. Even for you? Of course I'm terrified. But at the same time, you know, I married the guy 13 years ago, and I knew what I was getting into. You know, I think there's nothing better this regime, the Putin regime, would like us to do than to give up and run away. Uh, and we're not going to give them that pleasure. It's Even our country. Even after being poisoned? It's our country. We have to fight for it. He told us this in June. He went back immediately after, even though threats against him had intensified, like this video posted on Instagram putting him in the crosshairs of a sniper rifle. He was continuing his opposition work when just last month... All of a sudden, he begins experiencing this very elevated heart rate. His blood pressure drops very low. He begins sweating, and he has trouble breathing. His wife thinks her husband was attacked the same way as before. The first time, he had been dragged from one hospital to another to yet another while they were trying to establish the cause. Mm -hmm. This time, he was taken directly to the hospital to the same medical team that had treated him in 2015. And the moment they saw him, they knew what they were dealing with. And what do you think happened? The Russian doctor's official diagnosis is an acute intoxication by an undetermined substance, which is poisoning. This happened just as Washington was raising questions about President Trump's relationship with Mr. Putin. So last month, Vladimir Karamurza became an issue on the Senate floor. Vladimir has once again paid the price for his gallantry and integrity. Politicians on both sides of the aisle spoke out against the apparent poisoning, but the Trump administration has not. Remarkably, Karamurza survived again. Less than three weeks after he collapsed, he was flown to the U.S. And two weeks later, we spoke to him for a second time. You look pretty good. How, how are you actually feeling? Well, you're very kind. I don't think I feel as good as I look. He said he's recovering faster because his doctors knew just what to do this time. The Kremlin has denied any involvement. And since no poison has been found yet, supporters of Putin question whether he was really poisoned at all. We've been told that we are very naive, naive journalists, gullible, and that this whole thing is concocted by the opposition to fool the American people into thinking that that regime would do such a thing. To those who say that this is a plot, I honestly, and I mean this sincerely, I wish I never have to experience what I had experienced twice in the last two years. When you're trying to breathe and you cannot, when you feel your organs shutting down, giving up on you one after another, and when you feel the life coming out of your body in the next few hours, and you don't remember anything for the next month, and then for the next year, you're trying to re relearn how to walk, how to use cutlery, you know, how to talk to your kids. Again, I, I wish these people who tell you these things never have to experience this. I honestly, sincerely do. You were very, very sick and went back. Now, are you finished? Are you saying I'm not going back anymore? Oh, God, no, of course not. I'm, I'm, first You're of all, going I'm, to go back? Of course, I will absolutely go back to Russia. I'm Russian. This is my country.
and I believe in what I do and what my colleagues do. There are many of us. But not many have almost died twice. Many, unfortunately, have died. I'm, I'm the fortunate one. I'm still here. I'm still talking to you. Many of my colleagues cannot do that. Since he's been in power in Russia, Vladimir Putin has steadily cracked down on democratic freedoms and the protesters who support them, a crackdown that intensified after his re-election as president a year ago. Nothing symbolizes this better than the arrest last March of a group of young feminists after they staged a protest against Putin in Moscow's largest cathedral. It got a lot of attention since the Orthodox Church is one of the most revered institutions in post-Soviet Russia. The young women have become the poster girls of Russian descent. It's unlikely considering they're a punk band on YouTube that makes lewd gestures in cartoonish getups. Most of what they do is deliberately offensive. It might offend you. Like for starters, their obscene but attention-grabbing name Pussy Riot. This is what got them arrested. Five girls in the church in their trademark masks called balaclavas, praying to the Virgin Mary to drive Putin away. <laughs> Using vile obscenities, they blast Putin for limiting freedoms and jailing protesters. The whole thing lasts only 51 seconds before they're shut down. It looked silly, like a prank, which made the harsh punishment seem so out of proportion. Two of them were sent to labor camps for this. Now, a year later, we track down the other three who are at the church. Two are in hiding. Katya Samasevich isn't. She was put on trial and convicted but released after seven months because she never actually danced on the altar. That's her that day in white. Do you have any regrets about what happened that day? No, of course not. Look what's happened. Since the election, Putin has brought in a new level of oppressive government measures in Russia. She says they chose Moscow's biggest Russian Orthodox cathedral because in last year's election, the patriarch called Putin a miracle from God. The elections weren't legitimate. There was vote rigging, there was false counting. It was clear that the president put himself in power. But are you advocating the overthrow of this government here? Yes, we want the government to leave power because we consider it illegitimate. But we're advocating for a peaceful overthrow. The band members are idealistic and brave and well-educated. Katya is a computer engineer. She was living at home with her dad and working in a government arms plant when she decided to become a political provocateur. She began with anti-authority stunts, like surprising female cops by kissing them, then posting the video online. Her partner in crime was Nadia Tolokinakova, a philosophy student and seasoned agitator. They formed their punk band as Moscow was boiling over with protests in 2011 after Putin announced his bid for re-election. It was Russia's Arab Spring and the band, made up of 12 or so feminists who call themselves girls or devushki, set out to change the world. They staged public disturbances, like this one in the middle of Red Square, right under the Kremlin, howling, riot, riot, shouting a profanity that Putin was so scared of protesters, quote, he peed in his pants. Here you girls are. You're clearly really intelligent. And you put on these crude, almost juvenile acts. This is the language we've chosen, the language of punk. It's not highly intellectual. It's intentionally lowered, dumbed down. We've chosen this specific kind of language to attract attention. The Kremlin didn't pay much attention until the church performance, because that went viral. 
Katya, Nadia, and another girl, Maria Alokina, were arrested and then quickly became a cause celeb. Free Pussy Riot! South Park, Amnesty International, Madonna pled for their release. Their supporters, like chess master Garry Kasparov, who's been arrested many times for protesting against Putin, thought the case was trumped up. A lot of people I know who you would respect think that to be obscene in a church, on the altar, was a step too far. It was not a blasphemy. They asked Virgin Mary to kick out the dictator. I believe it was an act of, of civil courage, and they were, they were exercising their rights. Yeah, so, but the words were offensive. The they, words were, the words they were, they cussed. The words were offensive for Putin and for Patriarch, and I believe they both deserved it. But what exactly was the crime the ban committed? Sergei Markov, an academic who serves as a political spokesman for Putin, says authorities had trouble coming up with one. What exact law did they break? You know, some people say all they did was sing a song. They didn't even sing it, they lip synced it. On this issue? Yeah. That's right. It's the problem with uh, to find the law. Finally, the court found the law. What they found was the charge of hooliganism motivated by religious hate because the girls were disrespectful to the church. And Markov says if they had not been given a substantial sentence, believers would have rioted. Did the authorities intervene and say, give them a harsh penalty, much harsher than they deserved, because of a fear of violence? Absolutely. But is that Government... right? Do you think that's right, to stretch the law? It's duty of authorities to stop the violence. But there hadn't been any no. violence. It's critically a prediction. In their trial, the girls were defiant, Nadia pumping her fist as she was led into court. If Putin gave them a stage, they were going to use it. Did you ever consider begging for forgiveness, throwing yourself at the mercy of the court? No. The whole process was so unfair to us from the beginning. It's strange when you're innocent. Are you supposed to ask for forgiveness from the judge, who's ready to put you away for several years? No, this wasn't even discussed. Were you in the courtroom? Yes, all the whole time. Every day. Pyotr Verzilov, Nadia's husband and fellow political activist, saw his wife and the other two on display in a cage, an eerie echo of a Soviet show trial. When the verdict came, it was a jolt two years in prison. For me, it was obviously a shock. It's the last thing you expected? Yes. What about the girls? Well, the girls were smiling when it happened. They so were smiling? When you're really put in this helpless situation, when you understand that your life is decided by political motives and a lot of people really do understand that you're fighting for the good cause, the best thing you can do is actually smile. Katya was released, but Maria and Nadia, both young mothers of toddlers, were sent to faraway penal colonies. When the verdict was read, protests erupted outside the courtroom, and Garry Kasparov and two dozen others were arrested. Is this case of this punk rock group, is it really significant? Is it important? I think it is. Any attack on Putin is now a crime. Russia is now... it's. You may call it a modern dictatorship because you know attacking the ruler becomes a, a, it can be punished by the criminal court. And they represent that shift. Yes, they they exposed it. What was it about them that drew all, so much attention? You may say whatever you, you want about their performance, but it was innocuous. I mean, just it's, it, it was not threatening. And the state machine, KGB, George, you know, all going after them. I think it's just, you know, this some sort of a version of, it's not even David Goli uh, Goliath. It's just, you know, Goliath versus girls. That was not lost on those close to Putin. It looked like a very heavy-handed action against these weak little girls. Yeah. Like, way overreaction. Yeah, we know this. No one cares. I mean, you no, don't... No, 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 we care about this. We, the image. Yeah, we doesn't like uh, such awful image of Russia because it's uh, create problems uh, for us. This image uh, doesn't allow uh, millions of Russians uh, who want to 
travel to Germany, Italy, France, and to have vacations there easily. They don't allow uh, to do this. It's uh, stop investment to uh, Russian economy. Of All course. because of this trial? Yes, of course. Because bad image. All because of the trial of those girls. Of course. But we have to do because we have to protect ourselves. Because if we will be weak, our image will be even worse. It doesn't help the image that Nadia and Maria are suffering in harsh prison conditions. Maria is in Perm, where temperatures can dip to 50 below zero. Back in Moscow, her husband is raising their five-year-old son alone. We accompanied Nadia's husband, Piotr, on a seven-hour drive to Mordovia to see her. IK-18, that's what it's called, this one. He says she works grueling shifts sewing uniforms and that she's seen their five-year-old daughter, Gira, only once. Did you and Nadia talk about your child and well, the consequences, I'm talking about beforehand, the consequences of this little girl being raised without her mother? Well, obviously we do, we did talk about that enormously, but if you really want to change history, you have to be able to put everything you have on the line, and then you do have a chance of changing it. Changing history is not a hobby, it's not something you can take part-time. But there were four girls on the altar that day. What happened to the other two? Well, they went into hiding. We found one of them still hiding in Moscow a year later. So what do they call you? Court. Kot, you're the drummer in the group. Are you good? <laughs> Kot agreed to go on television for the first time, though only in disguised voice and balaclava. She wanted to show us that the band still exists, so she led us into a netherworld where some members of the band get together. She says very few people know her identity. Do your parents know that you were in the protest? They know. They're not really happy about it. My dad, he's religious. He thought what we did, it was sort of an anti-Christ kind of act. She had managed to dodge the authorities after the performance by hiding in the rat-infested music studio where they had recorded the song that got her bandmates arrested. Kot believes she will be left alone now as long as she keeps a low profile. Are you at all worried that just giving us this interview will be seen as a protest? I am a little worried. It's a feeling similar to what I had before the performances we did. Do you want it to be seen as a protest? I do. I want this. I'm here to say you shouldn't give up. What happened to us is unacceptable. It's been a year. President Putin is firmly back in power with solid public support. As for the opposition, Several organizers of last year's protests are facing prosecution. Nadia and Maria are soon up for parole, but the band has not staged a single action since the trial, and their videos are now banned. Mr. Putin seems stronger than ever. There are new laws against dissent. It sounds like it was <laughs> David and Goliath, and Goliath won. I don't think it's like that. It's a fight. It's an ongoing fight. Just because there was a court case doesn't mean that we're going to stop and shut our mouths. We have a lot of things to say. We're going to continue to work, continue to do what we do. So the battle of Goliath and the girls goes on. But like a Russian novel, it's complicated. The polls show that most Russians were offended by that dance on the altar but most also think the punishment was way too severe.